get started. Um, this session is pretty interesting. It, it's, it's about how it's critical infrastructure can, can go wrong and how we can secure them. Um, and we have one interesting paper about the industrial control system and two other papers about cellular network. All right. So the first paper is on industrial control system, which basically is quite different from what we typically deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and this paper is, is basically telling us how you can incorporate the control system, control theory, into, um, uh, I guess, integrated with our traditional security solutions. Right? So um, Hyroy will talk about this, his work. Hello, hello everyone, thank you so much for the nice introduction. My name is Jairo Giraldo. I'm from the University of Texas at Dallas. And today, me and my colleague, David Urbina, are going to be presenting part of our, our work in limiting the impact of stealthy attacks, and we focus on industrial control systems. This is a multidisciplinary effort that inclu includes knowledge from control theory, where actually that's my area of expertise, and, the, um, the, and David's expertise is in, in software engineering and computer science and cybersecurity. So also this work is a joint effort of different institutions. Whoa, sorry. Whoa. Oh, so sorry. What's going on? I don't know why it's off. Just turn it. It's a cyber attack. <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh, what is everything? Okay, <laughs> so sorry. So this is um, a joint effort of different institutions, the University of Texas at Dallas, the Singapore University of, Standard, of Technology and Design, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and the Royal Institute of Technology. So <clears throat> industrial control systems uh, are the core of critical infrastructure, and you can find, find them everywhere, uh, starting from manufacture, agriculture, uh, con uh, uh, nuclear, oil, and gas. And in, in the last decade, there has been an increasing effort to include communications in these kind of systems to improve the flexibility of the systems. However, the inclusion of, co of communications also make the system more vulnerable to cyber attacks. And I want to show you an, an example of, of uh, a very simple like industrial control system. In this case, we, ha we just have um, a tank. This tank has some, some level sensor. The, the sensor information is sent to, to a remote input output that converts the analog signals to, to digital signals that, that are transmitted through a communication network. The, the, the information from the sensors is sent to the PLC and the PLC computes a control action. So in this case, the, depending on the, on the sensor information, the, the PLC is going to tell the, the, the actuator, that in this case is the valve, to open or to close. So we, we see that the, the, the information is, is, is flowing through the communication network. We can see that the PLC sends the information to HMI and to the SCADA. And we can see that the real uh, water level uh, corresponds to what the HMI is, is seeing and, for instance, what the, what the operator is seeing. However, when we have um, an attacker, the attacker can modify the packet information such that it's going to, to lie to the PLC and the PLC is going to compute the wrong control action. And actually the HMI is also going to see like a, like a, a fake data. So in this case, the attacker uh, overflow the tank because it's, it's, it's saying that the, the, the water level is increasing is slower than what it, it, really, it really increases. So this is the, the type of attacks that, can be, uh, that can, you can found in industrial control systems. So in order to, to detect attacks and anomalies in this kind of systems, uh, one of the, one, a good approach is the physics-based anomaly detections. Why? Because attacks in industrial control systems have a direct impact on the physical process. Also because independent of the type of attack, 
These attacks are limited by the, by the physics, the laws of physics. And using this knowledge about the, the, about the physics of the system, we can generate some models to predict the behavior of the system and to compare with the real measures and then uh, um, uh, design detection algorithms. So I'm going to show you how this physics-based anomaly detection works. So imagine that we have the system that I, I just showed you before. We have the tank. And then the, the level of the water is increasing because the valve is open. And we have a prediction model that predicts the, the behavior of the, of the system. So the, using, using any, any kind of a prediction model, for example, linear dynamic systems, autoregressive models, nonlinear systems, we can predict the next step of the, of the water, and then we can compare it with the, with the real measure. However, when we have an attack, this, these sensor measures are not going to, to be close to the prediction. So we can take advantage of this, 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 of this difference to generate some residuals and then uh, uh, design some detection, detection statistics that allow me to know where, whether or not there is an attack. So for example, in this case, we can see that when, when there is not an attack, the detection statistic is always below a threshold, but when the, the attack is launched, the detection statistic starts increasing until it launches an alarm. So, and we, and we, we can have different detection statistics. Uh, we, 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 we found that in, in the literature there are mainly two, that is the stateless and the stateful. The stateless are the, the type of, of detection statistics that, are, that they, they focus in each time instant, and they compare the, the difference between the prediction and the real measure in, at each time instant, and we have the stateful that they accumulate all these residuals, and it's very useful for persistent attackers. So we, 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 we look in the literature to, to see to what we can find and what kind of physics-based detection ha can be found. And, and we, we tried different venues. Uh, we tried the control, the control theory papers, and we found like more, more than 40 papers. Uh, and in, in the control theory papers, and we also have the, the, the papers in the power grid venue and in the security and in, missile and in, in other approaches. And we design, uh, we, we propose a taxonomy that allow us to, to evaluate the different type of, of, of physics-based anomaly detection. So the taxonomy is based first in the detection statistics that you can find. Um, and one of the particular, uh, or the nice observation that we see here is that most of the papers use the stateless uh, statistics instead of the stateful. Also, we've, we found that the physical models uh, in, the, in the control system venue, they, mostly they use the linear dynamic systems, which is actually one of the, the typical ways to model dynamic systems. And in, but in the, security, in the security venue, we found that there is not like a, a standard way to, to model dynamic systems. And actually, that's one of the, the things that we want to highlight, that there is this big gap between the control theory and the, and the computer science, actually. And that's one of the things that we want to, to, to use here and we want to improve that we want to see that we want to show that we can use the control theory to um, generate like b better approaches that can be used for cybersecurity. Also, we can we can see that there are different type of metrics, but there is not like a unified way to, to measure the performance of uh, an anomaly detector. Actually, we can see that they, there are some 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 approaches that use the impact, some use some statistics, some use the true positive rate, the false positive rate, but there is not like a unified way to measure the performance of an anomaly detector. And finally, we also verify what kind of validation setup was used in the literature, and most of the works, they, they use simulations, of course, because it's, it's easier to, to implement. So seeing, seeing, observing this, this literature review, uh, we, we got a, lo a lot of questions. The, the first one is how can we compare all these previous proposals? And how can we know which kind of model is better or which detection is better? And how can we combine them? So um, we propose, or our, our contribution is that we, we propose a, a, a stronger uh, adversary model that leads to a new metric. Actually, that's kind of our main contribution is that we propose a new evaluation metric that allows us to fairly compare different detection mechanisms. Also, uh, and then we use this new metric to compare the different detection mechanisms in different setups, in simulation, in a real testbed, and also using real SCADA data. 
So to start, I just want to, to very quickly introduce the typical control loop. Uh, a control loop is composed by a physical process. Uh, the physical process has some sensors. So these sensors measure the states of the system. And uh, using these measures, we can, we can, the controller can generate a control action that is, is sent to the actuator. And the actuator executes this control action and modifies the physical process. So there are different types, the, the, attack, the attacks can be, can be uh, developed or deployed in different parts of the, um, of the, of the control loop. For example, it can be the, the deployed in the actuator so that uh, the, the control commands are going to be modified. Also, it can be, it can be deployed in the sensors where, where the, the sensor readings, uh, as I showed you before in the, in the example, are, are changed. And it, or it can be directly um, deployed in the controller where the PLC, for example, can be modified or can be tampered. Therefore, the, the detection block takes the sensor readings and the control commands to generate um, a model, uh, to generate a prediction using a, one of the models that I just mentioned. Then we have some residuals, and these residuals are going to, to fit the anomaly detector. That in, it can be a stateless or a stateful, and it can show if there is an alarm or not when there is the, in the presence of an attack. So I want to, to show you one, of the, one example. Actually, this is a real testbed from the Singapore University of, of, of Standards and of, of Technology and Design. And this, this, this testbed is composed by a tank. Actually, this is the same example that I showed you before. And it, it, here there are, there are some PLCs and there are the, the remote input output. So the, the tank has a sensor that, that measures the level of the water and this kind of, of tank can be easily modeled using just, just, just a very simple model. And in this case, we know that the next water level is given by the, the, the current like level of the water, plus the difference between the water that is coming in minus the, the water that is coming out. So it's just like a balance, a balance um, equation. And using, using this model, we, we can obtain a prediction of how the water should behave. Therefore, we, we, we launch an attack that is a man in the middle attack that takes the information from the sensors and modifies them. This type of attacks, um, we, we take all the packets from the, from the, from the inter, inter, internet cable and we modify the payload of, this, of these packets and then we send them back to the network so that the PLC and the HMI, they are never going to see that they, they actually the packets were modified. So the attacker is going to, to, to change the values of the sensor so that the, so that the, the PLC is going to, to calculate a wrong control action and the valve is going to remain open for, the, um, for a longer time and the tank is going to overflow. Actually, the objective of the attacker is to overflow the tank. So the, the attack can be, can be observed like this. We have here the level of the water increasing because the valve is open. And uh, in this point, we launch the attack. So what the attacker does is to set the, the sensor value in a fixed value so that the, the valve is never going to close. So uh, we, can, we can see here that the, the real value of the water is going to increase until it reaches the overflow, while the sensor reading is saying that the, that the, that the level of the water just remains still. However, using a, a detection statistic, in this case, the, the stateless detection, we can, we can see the sudden change and raise an alarm. One, so one of the interesting things here is that even if we change the threshold, we can launch, uh, we, we, can, we can detect this type of attacks. So here I, just, I plot uh, a probability, the probability of detection again, uh, versus the probability of false alarms, and we can see here that there is 100% of detection in, uh, using this type of detection mechanism. So, Everything works. This, we can see that our detection mechanism works perfectly. So, thank you so much, so much for your attention. <laughs> well, thank you, Jairo. But uh, no, we are not done here. Of course, this is you know very naive to think that we're going to be detecting easy attacks and we with a trend of you know Stuxnet lie attacks that can persistently stay stealthy and uh, for a long time. Therefore, uh, let's start uh, start defining a stronger uh, adversary model. 
assuming that this, of course, this attacker wants to take control of the physical process by compromising the sensors and actuators. But also let's assume that the attacker has complete knowledge about the system, that sees he knows the physical process, he knows how, to, how it behaves. Also he knows the detection statistic that we selected, he knows the um, uh, prediction model that we adjusted to the, to the physical behavior of the process, and, we, and he also knows the uh, detection threshold. Finally, of course, with all that knowledge, he can launch stealthy attacks that will never cross our detection uh, threshold. As you can see here again in the water example, uh, the, this attack deviates the physical behavior. You can see the residuals here, and they will never go beyond our detection threshold. That means that we don't have detection. Now, this type of stronger adversary models have been already previously proposed, but we are improving on them by taking into consideration the noise that the sensor injects on the, on the measurements, and we are also forcing our attacker to stay undetected even in the presence of stateful de detection statistics, and uh, we are forcing the attacker to optimize the impact of his attack. Finally, we want to do something new. We want our attacker to adapt, to adapt to our detection method. What does that mean? It means that even if we lower our detection threshold, trying to raise the alarms or to have a higher uh, uh, probability of detection, our attacker will adapt to that new threshold and will still launch attacks that will be undetected. Previous um, uh, evaluation metrics for anomaly detection have based on the trade-off between true positive ray and the false positive ray. But in the presence of this stronger adversary model, of course, we don't have any detection. That means that we cannot count any true positive ray. Moreover, we, we, want, we are forcing our attacker to launch attacks that will deviate the behavior of the system, but will follow it closely. And, and by following closely the behavior of the system, or the physical process, we, we claim that this attack will have a minimum impact. Therefore, the, the trade-off is not true positive ray versus false positive ray, but false positive ray be, and the impact of stealthy attacks. So that's why we propose a new metric that is a security metric. It's the the trade-off between the security metric, that is a maximum deviation imposed by stealthy attacks per time unit, and the usability metric that is expected time between false alarms. Now, if we plot the trade-off between these two metrics, we can see here in the y-axis, oh, sorry, okay, in the y-axis, uh, going down in the y-axis, uh, it means a more secure system. That means that we have less impact. And going to the right in the x-axis, we have a more usable system. That means a, a lower uh, number of false alarms. In this example, we can perfectly compare two different anomaly detections. You know, on the curve, we can see that the second one behaves better than the first one because you have, for every expected time between false alarms, you have less impact. It allows less impact on the physical process. Now, if we wanted, for example, to use the receiver operating characteristic curve that is a well-known um, uh, trade-off between the probability of detection and the false positive, uh, for, uh, false alarm, the probability of false alarms, we would see that in the presence of this stronger attacker that will launch a new stealthy attack per threshold, we always will have zero probability of detection. That means that we cannot use this type of metric. Instead, using our metric, we perfectly can see the tendency how the attacker can deviate the, the physical process. Now let's go back to our initial uh, example, the one that Jairo presented, the water tank. Remember here, the attacker wants to achieve an overflow. And the overflow, let's go here, occurs when the increment rate, the, the bias, a negative bias that the attacker is injecting in the sensor measurement in the water level, it, it will at the end, when, they, when it reaches the high point, that is when the PLC sends a signal to close the valve, the over, overflow course when that difference between the real one, that is the blue one, and the red one is greater in this case than, for example, 0 0.3. That means it's an overflow in, in this uh, experiment. Now, we can have other attacks, for example, the A3, 
that although it does deviate the physical process, it doesn't uh, reach an overflow. If we apply our metric, we can see in this example, we want to compare the stateful and the stateless detection statistics. And we can see here on the right, using our metric, how for any expected time between false alarm, the stateful detection statistics will limit the attacker. That means the attacker will never reach the 0 0.3 of the deviation. We can even select a very high threshold with a very low number of false alarms and still limit the, the, the goal of the attacker. Instead, with the stateless detection, it's not possible. Immediately, it reaches the, 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 the overflow. A second example would be a comparison between different prediction models, for it. in this case, linear versus nonlinear models. And for this, we are going to use the case of the water pH. Here, the PLC sends a signal to turn on a hydrochloric pump every time that the pH goes too, too, too high. And if it's too low, it turns off the, the pump. The important part here that I want you to understand is a, a very low level of pH, I mean, in particular, below 5, it can damage the system. It can damage the pipe. It can, it can melt the membranes. It can even damage the, the sensor probes. Now, if we, again, the, our attacker injects, a, uh, in this case, a positive deviation in the sensor, in the pH sensor. What induce is that the system, I mean the PLC, will keep the pump on for longer. And that will, it will induce a, a, a deviation in the real pH of the water. As you can see here, we want to, we use a system identification toolbox to create different prediction models. In particular, we have a LDS model of order 20 and two nonlinear models of order 50 and, and 100. It's easy to see in the left side that the nonlinear of order 100 doesn't allow the, the, the attacker in this attack of only four minutes to reach a pH of five. Now applying again our metric, we can see that for any expected time between false alarms, it is constant that the nonlinear of order 100, it will limit the, the attack. That doesn't mean that it will not reach the goal, but it, it will limit more than using the other two methods. Now, in, during this work, we did other case studies, but because of time constraints, I will not go over in detail in each of them. But in particular, we did, did analysis on, on real operational data in a real water treatment plant with more than 100 PLCs. And we tried to compare here a building in previous work that used um, autoregressive uh, auto models for, for prediction, we want to see how correlation in, in autoregressive models could help for, to limit the impact of an attack. And actually, we got the, the, that result, that correlation could be a technique to, to improve uh, the, the detection mechanism. We also did experiments in a physical, sorry, in a simulation of a smart grid. And here, what we wanted to compare is the type of, how the type of controller, in this case, a proportional versus a proportional integral controller, could be used to uh, uh, help in, uh, limit the impact of an attack. We got that a PI controller may help to uh, balance the, the, in, the, the deviation induced by an attacker to a point that it may not be possible to launch an stealthy attack. But of course, there are details. I encourage you, if you are interested, to ask me later after the presentation or check the, the paper. And finally, um, I want to summarize with the extensive literature review from security control, smart grid. Um, we generated a new, uh, stronger adversary model that is stealthy and adaptive to any method of detection. Um, from this a stronger adversary model, we uh, uh, um, created a new metric to evaluate for evaluation that is a trade-off between the impact of an attack, of an stealthy attack per time unit and the uh, expected time between false alarms. And we did experiments in different evaluation setups that we got different uh, results. For example, a stateful is better than stateless. We got the PI controller may be better than a simply pre-controller. And uh, correlation certainly is a good technique for to limit the impact of attacks in ICS. Thank you very much. Well, did you have any questions? So we'll have time for maybe two questions. Yeah. 
Uh, please, the name and the affiliation. Yes, uh, so Paulo Verissimo from the University of Luxembourg. I mean, this is, uh, you both guys did an excellent presentation. I am, oh, however, intrigued by your claim that you can do, you know, uh, anomaly detection with reasonable precision and recall based on physical process information. Um, how about if, you know, the attacker records a previous instantiation of the fill up of the tank, for example, or of the recovery of the pH after the chlorine pump is closed, except, you know, he records something which was slower and then he doesn't shut the water and, and, and just replace the slower real physical process because it has been replaced. And you cannot use nonsense, right? You know, it's an anomalous. What will happen? Well, you see, in that case, if, we, if you are replaying attacks, a preview, a preview behavior, no, in a, is an is a valid physics uh, behavior, physical behavior, we cer certainly may not have a total de detection, no? We, we, yeah. That's why what we are here claiming is uh, the attack that, is, that the, our attacker is inducing may have to deviate the physical process. In this case, if you are uh, replaying previous real behavior, uh, we may need to use other, other techniques. That's why a physics-based anomaly detection is always a, 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 a new block to, in order to protect the system, no? Yeah, but don't you think that when we talk about critical infrastructures, we're normally talking about skilled adversaries. Don't you think that's what a skilled adversary would do? You see, in the case of Stuxnet, that it did replay, but it replayed the traffic towards the supervisory control network. That is a higher level le networks of control. With that, uh, that, with that in mind, we still could detect because the detection that we are proposing is always at the level of the sensor and actuators. Uh, now, if if you, for example, use uh, replay the sensor, a sensor measurement, what we could use is correlation. Uh, we have done studies in that, and, and uh, it, it, because it, it, it would push you to actually not only attack one sensor, but multiple sensors. And, and it, no, it doesn't have to be in one control loop, but it can be multiple correlated control, control loops. Yeah. Well, I can complement a little bit. Um, uh, like, for example, if we see, if we see this example, uh, th this type of attacks, what it does is to, to, to change the level of the water like it's slower. So actually this attack can be even a replay attack that, that just changed the, the water of the, the level of the water is slower. So actually, uh, as you say, the, the type of, this type of attacks like a replay attack can be also measured in, with, with our metric. But, but, and in this case, what we want to measure is like how, this, uh, how slow that has, uh, has to be done or how, how slow this replay attack ha has to be launched such that it is not going to be detected and we can measure the impact of this attack. So actually we can, we can also use this, in the, in, even for, for replay attacks, we can use our, our metric to evaluate the impact because it's focused on, on how, how we can limit the impact for a specific detection uh, mechanism. I, I don't think so, but we can take it off. Uh, <laughs> okay, sure. So one last question. Okay, uh, Amit Kleinman from the Tel Aviv University. Uh, I, wa I wonder if you thought about uh, more complex uh, physical attacks or, uh, or uh, physical processes or even, uh, you know, a water hammer uh, effect where you have, you know, a sudden uh, close and opening of a valve uh, which can cause, uh, you know, an explosion and uh, it's maybe it's too late to, to uh, measure the physical process. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, the, depending on the, of the complexity of the system, it, it gets hard, harder to design like a, a very accurate model to, to do like, a, a, like a, as you say, maybe a sufficiently fast detection. But in this case, we are focused in the type of attacks that they just want to remain uh, stealthy. So even, even if, if maybe cause an explosion, it's, it's not like the type of attacks that we are considering very specifically here. We just want to, to, to consider the attacks that want to remain like um, stealthy and for, for a longer time, such that they can cause maybe a, a slower impact, but in, in a long time it's going to be a, like a, a bad enough impact. But yeah, it will be very interesting to, to consider like, like larger, larger system and better models, but, and, but it's get, it gets harder as, as long as the, the, the system gets more complex. But it can be done if you have eno enough knowledge about how to model these kind of systems. Okay, maybe we can discuss it offline. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, we, we, won't, we won't have time to. <laughs> well, he, he's the... Oh, you wanted to say something? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. 
Sorry. I just wanted to answer uh, or make a comment about the first question. So uh, we were not claiming that we are going to detect all attacks. Uh, our metric is completely different. We're, what we're saying is we're measuring, like, uh, we're trying to uh, measure the, the rate in which the attacker can affect the system while remaining stealthy. So yeah, I agree with you. Like, we're never going to have a perfect system that's going to detect all attacks. But our, our method, what we're trying to do is to say, well, we have these advanced adversaries that you, you say you have uh, that are going to remain undetected. So we're trying to, f and we do an optimization method that, well, we, don't, we, don't have, we didn't have time to present.